Good morning. I get to moderate this morning's conversation, and I just want you to know that the format is real simple. I ask questions, get discussion going, and I get out of the way. So um, let me just say another word about how we're going to operate this morning. There won't be direct questions from the audience. We have a, an, a, uh, a moderator to the public that we'll call on who will be speaking with folks during the course of the day and getting some feedback about issues that you have. We're going to test that out at the end of this session this morning. You have full bios of the panel in your packet, so I won't uh, give any lengthy introduction. Let me call upon the panelists to come forward. Uh, our, the Secretary of Education, Margaret Spellings, Governor Roy Romer, Tom Donahue, the President and CEO of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and Joel Klein, Chancellor of the New York Public Schools. Let's give them a hand. Well, panelists, we are less than 60 days from electing the next president of the United States and a new Congress, and this has been the longest election season in American history. Candidates have debated intensely uh, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. They have debated health care. Their focus has now shifted to a faltering economy and energy independence. Education, however, is not central to the debate. Even though our nation's students, particularly as Juan just pointed out, low-income and minority students are not getting the educations they need. And this failure to educate all students well is adversely affecting our nation's competitiveness globally. As other nations, as uh, Governor Romer pointed out, are meeting and overtaking the U.S. in preparing their students. So, how do we help the public and policymakers better understand that our failure to educate all students well is compromising our economic competitiveness and our national health. Tom Donahue, are our economy and education system linked? I think they're linked in many ways. Uh, I, for a long time, I harbored a belief that if we didn't do something about our education system, we could never be competitive. Now, unfortunately, I've changed my mind about that. I believe that if a significant portion of our children and our adults are educated, we have the potential of being competitive because of our extraordinary capital base and our ability to be innovative. On the other hand, if you take that view we are creating a problem in this country that is far more dangerous than a lack of competitiveness. And that is we're creating a two-tier society separated not only by economics, but by the ability to read and write and comprehend. And what I believe that that does, looking here in the United States and around the globe, it creates a group of people who are without hope, who are without, in many ways, the traditional family, however it is structured. It creates uh, an environment in which gangs and other social institutions are created. And it puts us in a position of spending large amounts of our national income and our national attention on things that this country ought to be turning away from, prisons, and law enforcement and, and social welfare programs and, and all of the, the negative part of what a society develops when people are denied the benefit of education. Now, that's a little melodramatic in some ways, but I think Margaret's uh, presentation and the governor's presentation and simply looking at the numbers we're doing a good job on this side over here. We're creating more and more people. The numbers are getting better. who are gonna be able to read and write. We're gonna be able to be competitive. They're gonna help us be a strong society. But where we need to focus is where we have fallen short. And it's not, and Juan made some very clear analysis of what's going on. Just come to this town. And if we do nothing else in this town, we have to support Michelle Rhee 
what she's trying to do. This was a national example of how to create the other side of the equation. And I think it, um, it gives us a little clearer focus. The American business community sends, spends $60 billion a year in educating and re-educating people. We need to get focused on, the, on those people that are falling seriously behind. And we need to do it with an open, a collaborative, a everybody's in the game approach. Because to adopt what I said, which we can compete without them, is to adopt what I fear for, that we will be destroyed without them. Chancellor Klein, uh, Juan Williams obviously raised the racial and class issue, but I, I'd ask you to just, you're, you're, at the, you're in this in one of the most diverse uh, cities in the nation. You're dealing not just with minority students, although a very large percentage of the kids going to your schools are. are, are is it just a black-brown issue? Uh, that, that number that Tom gave us about the re-education, is it just the black-brown workers we were having to get remediated? I don't think so, but I don't think you can understate the dimensions of the African-American Latino challenge we face. Margaret put up the statistics. However, there are a lot of issues that are clearly across the board, and Roy's data from the PISA test show you that in terms of where we are in science. Our top 5% in science and math are not in the top 10. So I think there's a lot of things that we need to address, but make no mistake about it, Juan Williams is exactly right. The civil rights issue of the 21st century has got to be education. There are far too many kids who are growing up in poverty for whom education is the last shot and basically we're abandoning those kids. We're not giving them the teachers they need, we're afraid of the accountabilities for them, and we're making excuses. And to me, you can summarize it in the following single statement. Every day, people, including people in this audience, tell me we'll never fix education in America until we fix poverty. And I think those people have it exactly wrong. We'll never fix poverty in this country until we fix education. And as Roy said, <laughs> and as Roy said, this is our Sputnik moment. People do not understand, given the global pressures that he's looking at, which will affect all of us, given that we cannot have a citizenry in which a few people or half the people are getting the education they need and deserve, and our most neediest kids are falling by the wayside. Where's the political will, Governor Romer? It's not there. And um, I, I think we have a real severe black uh, brown problem in, in terms of the inequities. But we have a national problem also. Uh, just look at the comparison of the NAEP scores with the state's rating of themselves. Only seven states have a performance that is even basic on NAEP. I mean, we are kidding ourselves. I go to Iowa, talk to the Des Moines uh, Rotary Club, and they tell me, hey, our children are 65% proficient, the English eighth grade. NAEP says they're 35% proficient. Compared to Singapore, they're probably 25% proficient. We have a massive failure to recognize that. Let me again go back to this morning's headlines. I'm not a guy that panics. I've been watching the credit circumstance of this country for a long while. I'm also looking at the capacity of China and India, just to take two, in terms of engineering talent. There is a real connection between uh, the advantage we have had in the last 100 years economically and our educational uh, fortunate circumstance. That is evaporating. <laughs> and and it, it, uh, I just think that we're asleep at the switch here. And the critical thing is this is not being uh, called out by the press of this country or the politicians of this country. And that was the point of my initial remarks. We really need to take seriously why. Let me give you just the analogy of Tony Blair in England. When, when Tony Blair took over and had 10-year reign, he began with education, and he had a national policy on education. We don't have anything like that. Excuse me, we do some good work. <laughs> we, we do some good work, and I support uh, Leave No Child Behind. But I'm just trying to say, uh, 
we're still asleep in this country, and, and all I want to do is just to hold up the NAEP scores, hold up the way we think we're doing at the states, and then go to the individual family, and they see their suburban kid getting a B and going to college and taking a remedial course, and they think this country's on a great path. I don't. You know, if I just make one ahead. point. We are doing all this in face of a demographic challenge that this country faces that is highly significant. 77 million people are getting ready to retire. We are going to depend on almost every human person in this country to fill in the gaps and a lot of work on the immigration side as well. So we, every time we leave a child behind, every time we leave a school behind, every time we leave a community behind, we're exacerbating a demographic challenge on the upside where we need more skilled uh, scientists and engineers and mathematicians and, and on the downside where we need people to work in all of the service industries. We've got to look at education in a more practical sense than we have in the past. It is not just education over here. It's where do we get the workers? Where do we get the people that are going to hold up the society and move it forward? These are a series of challenges that are more complex than they used to be. Well, in let, me, let me ask you the question. Business has really been a leader in pointing at the, the failures of our education system. But has that been embraced beyond the business community as an urgent issue? Well, well first, let me not run away from the business community because I don't think they've done as much as they could and should. You know, a businessman that works in Des Moines, Iowa is not going to get himself involved in the running a medium-sized company. He's not going to get on the school board because nothing happens at the school board until 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm exaggerating, but the point is they all have a great idea and everybody wants to work on the local level and everybody tries to chip in and support a school. But business has got to take a much more fundamental view of this. That's why we're working, working with John Podesta and others to really drive a look at the, exactly what the governor is saying. Here's what the states are saying, what is the federal government saying, and what are the 10 things that American business can do to be helpful. Um, we've got a long way to go before we can stand up and say we did it all, and you can't, you can't excuse business by the amount of money it spends. It spends tons amount of money, but it has to become a more visible force on the education side. It is our fundamental product, and if we don't get it, we can't do the things we want to do. We can't be as successful as we should and, and so we're trying to press the business community to become far more active, far more aggressive, and far more clear-headed about what's going on in their communities and what do they have to do if they want to succeed. Secretary? You know, Roy, basically we're fat, dumb, and happy as a country. <laughs> it's as simple as that. And, you know, Roy said, well, we're going to hold up the NAEP scores and hold up the state data and let's commit. Roy, you wouldn't be holding up anything but for No Child Left Behind. Six years ago, about half the states participated in the NAEP. We didn't even have a full picture. We didn't have a national report card that was a real national re report card. And we darn sure didn't have annual measurement in every single state in this country. We are at the lip of the cup in the real conversation that we have to have. But without information, without that table setting, there is no urgency. As I said in my remarks, without public will, public support and public understanding, politicians and policymakers don't feel any need to scratch the itch. Just simple as that. I've been in this vineyard for a long time. And we have to make the case that every American, whether they're in Fairfax County, Virginia, or Anacostia, D.C., we have a stake in each other's kids. And we have done a very poor job of making that case. And this is where I think the business community is so essential, because every single solitary person in this country is needed for this economy, unless we want to live in you know, somewhere else. Just simple as that. But that's why this threshold moment and the pressure on accountability is so fierce, because it is about to explode this information. What are we going to do about it? You know, Clearly, it's a moral imperative, a civil right, the right thing to do. But doggone it, it's also, we're, gonna, we're not going to live in the most progressive, innovative country in the world if we don't do this work. Simple as that. Right, Tom? That's right. And it is, uh, 
it, it is great to get excited and talk about it and have a lot of cheerleading. It'll get, you've got to get down to the basis. We need real data. We need to know what's going on. We need to enable people that are trying to do this job, superintendents and principals. We need to face reality. And, and I'm pressing the business community, and we are, uh, to, to just take another step, to get more engaged. Chancellor? Yeah, well, what we really need is to get very serious about a few specific things. First of all, Margaret's right. In the absence of accountability, it's game over. And a critical component of accountability is our willingness to test our kids. Now, we can do a lot better in testing, but if you think this is a Sputnik moment, then you should be calling, I believe, for national standards and national assessments put together by the leading business and academic and educational thinkers in our country. Serious countries throughout the world do it. Roy wants to benchmark it. He says it's got to be done through federal incentives. My own view is it's got to be done through national leadership, whether you incentivize it or you pull together a a presidential commission. All the knock on the tests, a lot of that is about the fact that people want to avoid accountability and the system has got to be built from the ground up based on accountability and how our students perform and that's got to be our primary issue. The second issue, the Aspen Institute called out and people don't want to talk about it because it makes it uncomfortable, but Juan Williams highlighted it today. Let's be candid, the most important thing and the quality of a kid's education is the quality of his or her teachers. Everybody knows that. When I talk about quality, I talk about the impact of a teacher on student outcomes. As to that most important thing, we have massive inequities in the United States. Our neediest kids are not remotely getting their fair share of the highest performing, highest quality teachers, and we've got to stop that. And we've got to stop that through using federal incentives that will enable us to attract high quality people to the greatest challenges. That's a massive inequity. And the third thing we got to do is we've got to use federal power and federal dollars to incentivize increasingly choice for people in our high poverty neighborhoods. When we started in New York under Michael Bloomberg, we had 16 charters pulling teeth year after year. We're now up to 80 charters and we still have thousands and thousands of parents, parents in high poverty communities who are seeking to get into those very charters. If we're going to get serious about this, it's going to take national leadership and it's going to take doing things that people tell you can't be done. That's what made the Sputnik moment incredible, was everybody told John Kennedy we couldn't put a man on the moon. And you know what happened? We put a man on the moon. We can have national standards, we can incentivize greatness in our school system, and we can create meaningful choice, not just for the wealthy, but for all people. This is great. I, I <laughs> give him a hand. I'd like to agree with him. I, I, I want to get there. National standards, okay? When you're Poli my age, you'll be there. Right? Uh, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be 80 in October. I'm not there yet. Uh, look, got a long way to go. The uh, that's one way, one goal. My, I've made a political judgment that that's not doable now in these United States. Therefore, I'm being very specific on alternative B. Let me describe it. 30 days after the next president is elected, he calls 50 governors and 50 state school officers into the East Room of the White House. And he says, I want 15 of your states to agree within 90 days to world-class standards and agree to benchmark every year against the 10 best nations in the world. If you do that voluntarily, then I as president will pay for the design of your tests with Congress approval, pay for the administration of tests, and I'll put a package that helps you get better teaching in classrooms on the table. Again, you can participate voluntarily. You say to the other 35 states, come join if you want. And if you start with math and science, and if there's still enough science, math war in this country that says, no, there's two ways to go, you get two groups of 15. But the key to it is, Go back to my map of 15,000 school districts. That's, that's a problem of governance. And you can't bring this nation together dealing with that large a committee. We need to have uh, some very uh, strong leadership after this next election on this issue. So I'm happy to join that bandwagon, but I'm trying to be realistic and say at least get alternative B on the table and let it grow into A. I, I want to tell a couple anecdotes. 
about two years ago, I guess it was, all the nation's governors came together and they said, we've got to do something about this dropout program problem. And they all, 50 of them, signed on to a compact to tackle the dropout problem and adopt a uniform graduation rate. You know how many have done it? A handful. I'm putting in place a rule that'll go into effect this fall that says, game over, let's do it. And so, <laughs> good for dropout rate. But the point is, one of the things I worry about in this whole debate is we have a lot of speedometers that say we're going too slow. And in the meantime, while we get the world's greatest standard and all of that, which theoretically I'd be for, what are we going to do? Lots of people in the system take a big sigh of relief and say, well, I'll be retired by then, or I guess I'll just wait till the new speedometer comes on. And all of the kind of real world stuff that happens when we policymakers debate big stuff like this. Now, in the perfect world, maybe that's the way we do it. But what do we do in the meantime? We got 50 state speedometers that says speed up and no willingness. Now, the last thing I want to say is, and you know, I'm the one that looks at these plan amendments from the states. I hear a lot of rhetoric from governors. God bless them. I love them. I used to work for, I've worked for two of them. Um, the, the political will cannot sustain a system that says, we stink. Your next door neighbor who's a teacher isn't doing her job. The lady you go to church with is not effective. She's a PhD and she should be in the inner city and she's in suburbia. What's up? And we have not had the conversation about how we use people and how we use time. So I worry that some of our detractors think, whew, let them talk about standards because, you know, they're laughing all the way to the bank. And I just want us to be cautious about the wonkery of this. Rome is burning and we need to put out the fire. But that's going to happen at the local level, Margaret. I mean, in New York City, we put a letter A to F grade on every school. We've closed some 80 schools during the past five years. We've opened, as I said before, 65 charter schools. And you're one in 15,000, Joel. Uh, but that's the real action. It's not what Michelle is doing here, what's yeah. happening in Denver, Two, what's happening three, in New Orleans. There's, that's where the real action is. But what you need is a national umbrella. So take the teacher quality issue. There are two things the federal government can do. It can put federal dollars, not just give it out under Title I, but it could put it toward incentivizing two things. Those teachers that are getting the best results with their students, a real value-added process that says there are federal dollars. It could put it to saying, if you pay the same for math and physical education teachers, you're not gonna get the right mix of math teachers. And it could put it toward attracting math and science teachers. You're gonna have a math and science crisis. But in other words, it'll incentivize these things. It'll incentivize saying to that PhD that it's a different challenge going to a high poverty school and therefore there'll be different sets of rewards. Amen. And the federal government could then reinforce a lot of the things kind of thing. We did a pay for performance agreement with the UFT in New York City. But the federal government could put a lot more muscle, dollar muscle, behind that. And these are the nature of the challenges. If we don't change the quality of teaching mm -hmm. in our high poverty, high needs communities, then these kids are not going to get the education they need. If you don't bring the science and math teachers in, it's just simple supply and demand. You get different people in a science and math equation than you're going to get in other subject areas. Every university in America realizes it. Every university realizes it. We don't realize it in K to 12. And as a result, then Roy puts up the data that says, well, we got a 21 and a 26 on math and science. And we, we're gonna change that. It's gonna take real national leadership because at the local level, it's hard to collectively bargain around a lot of these issues. There are real centrifugal forces to maintain the status quo. And I give those unions like ours that have done some bold things a lot of credit. But federal leadership will facilitate I'm for federal that. leadership. I am Hi, one. Governor. <laughs> I want to speak about Rome burning. Uh, <laughs> I, I agree, Margaret. Uh, we can't just leave our reform only to standards. We need to do a lot of things immediately, et cetera. But I don't want to leave the conversation that standards don't count. Let's go to the issue of how do you change the collective will of this country? I think one device would be to have a presidential report card to every family every year about the status of your youngster's education compared with 
the job market in the world. Now, if you were to, because, and, and have that translated into dollars. In other words, if I had an eighth grader, I'd like to get a report card and said, here's where the eighth graders of the world are gonna be 10 years from now and competing for jobs. Here's where your eighth grader is, a year behind. Here's the economic consequence of that. Give that information to the American families. That has got some potential for beginning to move. But the critical question is, how do you give the score? Now, I watched the Broncos last night beat San Diego 39 to 38. We know how to keep score in football. But to keep score educationally, you've got to agree to certain things. You've got to agree this is what it is that we want you to acquire in terms of skill, knowledge, and, and, and understanding. And here is the way we're going to measure it. And those tests are bubble tests now. We need to improve the hell out of that. And we got 50 different states doing it 50 different ways. That is uh, not going to get us to where we need to go. I don't want to do only standards, but I think you've got to get that measurement right if you ever to convince people. Let me use the, the analogy of health. When I go to the doc and I get an x-ray, I want to have an understanding of what good health of a lung is because then I'm gonna change my behavior to try to make my lung like that. That's what educational score tests ought to help us do. You know, we've, um, I, I'm glad to hear you talk about this. We got together with the Progressive Policy Institute and we said we're gonna take the federal numbers, right? the best numbers you have. I'm not sure how good they are, but the federal numbers. And we're gonna give on four or five categories, we're gonna give every state's school performance a rating, A, B, C, D, E. And, and we went out and did it, and then we highlighted the positive things, wrote uh, some critique of what had to be done, and raised some ways that the business community and others could be helpful in those communities. We're about to go out and do the second measurement. What do we know about it? The number's not very good. The, 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 the core numbers. So we need better data. And when we get some rational data where people have to measure up, uh, at least they know the numbers are right. In the meantime, we're gonna continue to ask the business community, ask parents, ask the educators to step forward. Second point, you know, you listen to the things that have been done in New York and in Colorado and, and in Chicago, and you know, that, there's a lot of things going on here. There's a lot of progress going on. There are a lot of communities that have gotten themselves all exercised and they're going out and getting people um, of high skill to come in here and take on these challenges. We weren't doing this 10 years ago. We have started a movement. We're, we're confused a little, we're, we're bumping into each other, but this thing is moving in a more, more thoughtful way. And what are we trying to do? We're trying to let people know this is a problem we're trying to let them look at imperfect numbers and find some ways that we ought to begin to do a better job. We're identifying courageous uh, mayors and governors and others that are going in there and starting to turn the, the China over and break up the, 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 some of the cadres that have been out running this system. We've got good things going on. We ought to build on it. We ought to sort of do what everybody said here. But most of all, what we're doing is not acceptable. And the big problem is it's not a matter of catching up with us with a, a number that's not gonna move, the demands of the business community, the demands of demographics, the demands of global competition are making it all the more difficult. So the sooner we get going with whatever seems to work, let's do it. We'll sort it out as we keep going. We'll get dressed on the way to the prom. <laughs> Tom, there is a lot of urgency among the leadership. And uh, you know, we have business leaders saying that this is a crisis. We have courageous local and state political leaders who are saying this is a crisis and who are putting their political uh, capital on the line. You, we've seen that with, with your mayor in New York. We see that with uh, Mayor Fenty here. Uh, how fragile is this, uh, this momentum and this movement if it's reliant upon uh, individual courageous leaders on the local level, number one, uh, so I, I and, and I'd, I'd like you to answer that, uh, Chancellor Klein. And then, you know, because you're going to have an election in New York. What happens if you elect somebody who doesn't like the Bloomberg approach and and says I'm going to take another one? So number one, how do we, how do we build and sustain that sense of urgency? And number two, have you built any demand?
to sustain this from the actual people who are being served by this. It, are the black and brown communities of yes. New York going to tolerate bad schools in the next mayoral administration? I sure hope not. But I think you've got, I think first of all, local leadership, national, these all matter. When you talk about Bloomberg or you talk about Mayor Fenty, you talk about Daly, you talk about Menino, these are mayors who put themselves on the line. And I give them a lot of credit. And we should never allow these mayors off the hook. There will be a big fight in New York about reauthorizing mayoral control. Right. Because a lot of local politicians want to get their hooks back into the system. I hope the citizens of New York say, whatever the policies of the next mayor are, we want a mayor who's as accountable for education as he or she is for safety, for health, and all the other things, the economics of a city. Second of all, it'll take national leadership, I assure you. And it'll take people who are willing to speak the truth about these issues. And in terms of our communities, that's all the work we're doing. When, when I say that there are some, right now, 15, 20,000 families on the waiting list for charters, you know, you're gonna hear from those families in this political discussion because they see the options that are available to other people in their community and their neighborhood. They go to the same churches that Margaret is talking about and they talk to people and that will create a rising tide. And then the last thing which ties into what Tom and Roy, while everybody's else, everybody else is talking about standards, what we do in New York is we cluster schools based where they start. So let's say your average proficiency rating is 60 in math and 55 in English, grades three to five. We cluster, we've got 20 schools that have the identical mix of kids. And each year we put out what we call a progress report that shows which move forward and which move backward. Apples to apples, you have no excuse because you started at the same level and it's the same test. May not be the greatest test, all took the same test. And what happens is this creates a rising tide. There's already research showing those schools that get the D's and the F's, they get serious about the work that they're doing they want to move forward. Those schools that are traditionally coasting because they have a good reputation, because they're in the right zip code, some of those schools, one was written up last week, don't do well. That school will now feel the pressure. Give the people the information, give them the data, make it apples to apples, and you will get a citizenry involved. But it'll take national leadership. Margaret. Michael, excuse I, I, me, yeah, yeah. as you know, you I've have. got an executive committee in town. I want to go talk to them about education. You go take care okay. of those markets. Thank you very much. Excuse and the last sentence, you've done a hell of a job. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, I, then I get the last word. Donahue, excused absence. <laughs> uh, obviously, you know, these are deg minor degrees of separation. We are both all in violent agreement and are, are warriors in the same, uh, on the same battlefield. And, and I, you know, just want to restate the fact that, you know, we cannot let the perfect be the enemy of the good. I mean, Tom talked about, you know, dressing on the way to the prom, and that's, that's really right, because I think, you know, making the case with the American people is essential. Uh, this, this need to, you know, keep on. We get together and we talk about wonkery, and I think the American public tunes us out. And so, you know, our little degrees of separation are minute, and uh, I look forward to working with leaders like them, especially uh, courageous leaders like, like Joel, who have the battle scars to prove his, his uh, fortitude. And uh, I commend the mighty leaders that are pulling uh, this movement forward. Thank you, Joel. Roy. Thank you. Let me ask uh, Governor Romer a question about the people we're leading. Uh, you've been going around the country, uh, in Ed in 08, uh, the uh, uh, efforts uh, underwritten by two leading American foundations, the Eli Broad Foundation and the Gates Foundation, uh, to help build a broader coalition in support of reform. What's the good news about the coalition building? The good news is that uh, our particular communication has had some effect upon the staff of the two presidential candidates, and I think on the candidates themselves. But the better news is that we have really touched a, a movement throughout this country that knows we've got to do better, we've got to do better. Uh, but let me extend that answer one more step. Um, I, uh, and you heard it in my remarks uh, in the last hour, I am very concerned that we still 
don't have hold of this issue. Uh, to quote Margaret, America is asleep. We're living upon past uh, accomplishments. And uh, I don't know, uh, I mean, there is a wake up call today. Again, I'm talking about Wall Street a lot today, but that's a very, very significant event for America. And I, I wanna turn to the average family. What are they talking about today? They're talking about, is our home gonna be foreclosed on? Can our children afford the kind of house we now live in? Do we have enough money in our family budget to send our kids to college? And they look at where the world is going in terms of high-priced jobs. They're smart enough to know that they can't have kids that are 25th in math at 15 years of age compared to the world. The average American family needs some political communication with people who are willing to take that risk. And I gotta come back to the issue of the map, the 15,000 jurisdictions. Uh, we don't know yet in this country how to get our act together in education and still honor the value of local government. And we gotta be a lot smarter than we've been today on that. Uh, you know, Margaret, I agree with you on Leave No Child Behind. I think we're going about 16 mile an hour. I wanna go 66 mile an hour. I, I'm, I'm on that, I just think we gotta go further and faster. I mean, let me just add one point because I think it touches on everything that's been said. The reason this crisis doesn't get the traction, it's not about, I think, the best being the enemy of the good. And I think No Child Left Behind has done a lot of good for this nation. And let me tell you, if those numbers weren't out there, we would not be having this discussion. But the way I conceptualize, and I know this is wonkery, Margaret, but, he, but it's important because I think it helps us understand how to engage a challenge. If we randomly assign children to schools in New York City, and you couldn't opt out, you couldn't move out, you couldn't go to private school. Nobody would tolerate the school system. Nobody would tolerate that school system. But what we have is a crisis that is to some degree global, but in no small measure what Juan and Tom Donnie were talking about, affecting our highest needs kids, the greatest. And so a lot of people don't perceive it as a crisis because it's not affecting their children in the same way. Now the only way I know to deal with that is to talk the economics, but to also focus on the, on the moral dimensions of it. 54 years after Brown versus Board, we promised every kid, took us 170 years to get there, we promised every kid an equal educational opportunity. And there's not a person in America who thinks you can get an equal educational opportunity if you grow up in a high poverty, high needs community. That's wrong. And we've gotta call it out, and it's gotta have not just an economic imperative, which it will have, but also an immediate moral imperative that says no mas. But do you really think that most of those average Americans uh, see the demographic shift? That they see that unless we educate those black and brown kids, uh, those, the jobs that we are creating here uh, won't be filled because we won't have a skilled, trained workforce to take those jobs. But, but that's what I think leadership is about in the end. You know, people told, when Mike Bloomberg ran for mayor, they told him, why do you want control of the schools? You, you're gonna run again in four years, you'll never turn them around. <laughs> What's wrong with you? Don't you have good political instincts? And he said, why be mayor if you're not gonna be on the hook? for this, and we've challenged a lot of orthodoxies, and you know, we've worked together, but we've challenged and we've pushed. We've done things wrong, we've made our mistakes. You see what Michelle is doing here with Mayor Fenty, and that's leadership. Look, she always talks about it. Every Friday they pick it outside her office, right? But on the other hand, she's changed the discussion and the paradigm, and people in the community begin to perceive that, when they see they have options, when they see their schools getting better. And that's what I think leadership is the critical variable in all of these things. And if we're afraid to challenge orthodoxies, if we're afraid to challenge entrenched groups, then I think we're not gonna move the ball down the field. But I don't think the American people fully understand what's at stake here and the imperative of educating every child. And I've talked about it in some of my remarks that you know, the Nickleby kids, I mean, I hear that out on the road. I mean, the Nickleby kids get such and such and so forth uh, that, you know, our gifted program got cut because of the Nickleby kids. We can't have art because of no child left behind. This zero-sum game attitude that's mine, not yours. 
and that has to change. And we can change it through report cards like Roy's talking about, through data, through the civil rights community. Every arsenal uh, or every weapon in our arsenal has to be brought to bear, but I do not think the American people adequately understand why they have to have a stake in every kid in their community. It's them, it's not us. Exactly, that's right. So on that point, I think I'm gonna conclude. Let's give our panel a hand. Thank you very much.